Today, we are soaring into the urban air mobility, uh, the UAM race. This is really that massive high-risk frontier, you know, where electric air taxi is promised to fundamentally reshape how we move around cities. Okay, so let's unpack this a bit. We've got two uh, giants leading the charge here in the U.S., Jogi Aviation, that's J-O-B-Y, and Archer Aviation, A-C-H-R. Our mission today is really to distill the critical differences between their strategies, their blueprints, because, look, betting on this market, it means betting on one core philosophy over the other. That really is the crucial starting point. You've got Jody pursuing this um, capital-intensive, vertically integrated model. The Tesla of the skies idea. Exactly. They want to control every single phase, from their you know sophisticated proprietary design to the manufacturing plants and eventually actually running the flight operations themselves. Okay. Archer, on the other hand, they're positioned as, let's call them the pragmatic integrator. They're embracing a much more capital light, partnership-driven approach. So focusing their efforts. Right. Focus on design, software, getting certified. Right. But they outsource the really heavy, expensive lifting, specifically manufacturing, leaning on established auto giants. So this deep dive is really about assessing which of these paths carries, well, a higher probability of success in actually scaling a whole new mode of mass transport yeah. while, you know, minimizing the inherent risks. And the market. I mean, it's incredibly forward looking here. It's driven almost entirely by narrative, not cash flow right now. And it seems like it's struggling to decide who's actually got the better story. Oh, absolutely. Volatility basically defines both companies. They are definitely high beta instruments. High beta meaning? Highly sensitive to news, swinging much more wildly than the overall market. If you just look at the comparison, Archer is significantly more volatile. Its beta coefficient is, what, 3.43? Wow. Joby's around 2.52. But look, both dramatically exceed the S&P 500 benchmark, which is 1.0. Mm -hmm. So you're not betting on steady economic growth here. You're really wagering on a major corporate breakthrough. But isn't a beta that high, like 3.43 for Archer? Isn't that a massive red flag? Why would the market reward that kind of extreme risk right now? Especially when, as you noted, Archer posted that huge one-year gain over 261%. Yeah, that's the core paradox, isn't it? Archer's gains, they reflect the market rewarding their perceived speed, their aggressive partnership strategy, get to market faster, maybe. Okay. However, the current valuation gap tells maybe a deeper story. Joby's market cap is standing higher, roughly $15.63 billion. Compare that to Archer's $7.46 billion. Almost double. Right. The market is currently assigning a higher probability of success or perhaps, you know, a larger potential slice of the pie to Joby. It implies investors believe that if Joby successfully navigates the huge execution risk of its vertical model, well, the payoff in terms of control, integration, long-term margins, that'll justify the higher price tag now. So valuation is entirely a function of the corporate story right now. Precisely. And Joby's narrative, the story of technological mastery, ultimate control that currently seems to hold the edge in valuation, even if Archer has seen some sharper short-term stock pops. Okay, that sets the stage perfectly then. So let's look under the hood. What does that technological mastery actually look like for Joby? And how does Archer's uh, more pragmatic design reflect its strategy? Well, Joby's aircraft is definitely highly sophisticated. It's a tilt rotor design, features six pretty large electric motors that physically pivot. Or tilt. And that complexity buys them performance. It seems so. Superior performance targets. Yeah. 200 miles per hour top speed and a really impressive 150 mile range target. And crucially, that tilt rotor thing. That must mean they had to invest heavily in noise reduction, right? Aiming to be almost silent against city noise. That's a huge hurdle for acceptance. Exactly. That's been a key focus. Joby has prioritized technological supremacy, and they've protected it. They have an extensive IP portfolio, something like 267 patents globally, covering complex bits like the propulsion unit tilting power redundancy. So the high-cost, high-reward path. That's the one. Archer, on the other hand, is, well, pragmatic. Their midnight aircraft uses a simpler system. It's lift plus cruise, which they call the 12-tilt-6 configuration. Yeah. 12 propellers overall. Six are just dedicated to pure vertical lift, like a helicopter. And the other six tilt slightly forward for thrust once it's airborne. It's just mechanically simpler than a full tilt rotor. And simpler usually means easier to maintain, maybe easier to get certified by the FAA. Absolutely, that's the thinking. Yeah. It optimizes for those shorter, high-frequency routes. Think 20 to 50 miles, maybe airport to city center. Top speed target is 150 mile per hour. It's a design really optimized for the business model, maybe not pushing the absolute range limits. Okay. And this brings us right back to those analogies we mentioned. Joby is the integrated pioneer. Think the Tesla model. 
control everything, guarantee quality, aim for higher margins long term. Wow. But be prepared for huge capital needs and serious execution risk. Right. And that partnership with Toyota fits perfectly there. Toyota helping them implement world-class manufacturing in their Ohio facility. Precisely. It reinforces that commitment to mastering production. And Archer, then, is the pragmatic integrator, more like the Apple model. Exactly. Focus on your core strengths. Design, software, the customer experience. But let capital-heavy partners handle the manufacturing lines. Stellantis is their key partner there, co-funding and planning to operate their big Georgia facility. Archer really aims to be the Uber of the sky. Manage the network, own the customer, but without the massive burden of total vertical control. Got it. Okay, let's shift gears then to commercial validation, because these strategic partnerships, they aren't just names on a press release. They act as really powerful signaling tools, right? They help de-risk the future in investors' eyes. Immensely important. Joby is integrated quite deeply already. They've got that exclusive home-to-airport service partnership lined up with Delta Airlines that's backed by potentially up to $200 million in investment from Delta. And they also acquire the passenger business of Blade Air Mobility. That instantly gives them existing infrastructure, like landing pads, and a customer base to tap into. It's all about securing that operational pipeline early on. Okay, so Joby's locking down the service side. Meanwhile, Archer seems focused on locking down the actual aircraft orders, the flight lines themselves. That's a good way to put it. Their flagship partnership is with United Airlines. It involves a massive conditional order, potentially up to $1.5 billion worth of aircraft. Conditional being the key word. It is. But the real signaling event, the thing that made people sit up, was a tangible $10 million pre-delivery payment from United last year. That's real cash changing hands, not just a letter of intent. Okay, that is significant. And their overall indicative order book, combining various agreements, is apparently close to $6 billion. Now, again, mostly conditional, but it signals huge potential demand for their partnership-focused approach. Interesting. What about internationally? Oh, what's fascinating here is the global strategy playing out. Both are aggressively pursuing international markets, particularly the UAE, Dubai specifically. Why the UAE? It seems to be acting as a crucial regulatory sandbox. It might allow them to launch early commercial operations, maybe on a smaller scale, and gather invaluable real-world flight data, potentially outside the slower, more complex U.S. certification process initially. Uh, I see. Get flying sooner somewhere else. Exactly. And that operational data feeds directly back into their FAA certification efforts here in the U.S. It could significantly accelerate the whole timeline if it works out. Okay, wait a minute, though. If the story is everything right now, as you said, oh, well, the biggest risk to that corporate story isn't necessarily the tech failing. It's running out of cash before you actually cross the finish line. Bingo. So let's talk about their survival metrics, the, uh, the capital runway. Who has the bigger war chest? And this is where Archer currently holds a significant, almost undeniable financial advantage right now. Really? Even with Joby's higher valuation? Yes. Archer reported uh, liquidity of over $1.7 billion recently. That's thanks to some successful capital raises they pulled off. Joby, despite that higher market cap, had about $991 million in cash and short-term investments as of its last reporting. So is that the $700 million difference? That's massive in this pre-revenue stage. It's huge. Now let's look at the burn rate. How fast are they spending that cash? Right. Joby is guiding for an accelerating cash use in 2025, somewhere between $500-$540 million for the year. That's driven largely by ramping up that capital-intensive manufacturing capacity in Ohio. Okay, half a billion a year, roughly. What about Archer? Archer's estimated annualized cash burn is lower. It's projected around $400 million. Still a lot, but less than Joby's projected burn. So, okay, more cash, lower burn rate for Archer. Let's do the math. What does that mean for their runway? How long can they last? Simple division, essentially. Yeah. For Joby, with just under a billion in cash and burning over half a billion a year, their estimated runway is just under two years. Wow, less than two years. That's yeah. tight. It is tight, especially given the uncertainties around final certification timelines and manufacturing ramp-up. Mm. Now, Archer over $1.7 billion in cash, burning around $400 million a year. Their estimated runway stretches out to over four years. Four years? Over four years. So when you look at that four-year cushion for Archer, you realize they are paying a potential strategic price, maybe lower long-term margins because they rely on partners, but they are buying themselves the most precious commodity in this wow. whole race, time. 
flexibility. That extended runway has got to be a huge de-risking factor for Archer in the eyes of many investors. Okay, but let's move to the ultimate risks then. Because the road ahead, it's fraught with complexity for both. What are the specific Achilles heels, you know, the, the company specific weaknesses that could trip up these powerful but very different strategies? Yeah, beyond the common risks that apply to everyone here, yeah. being pre-revenue, expecting big losses for years, mm -hmm. the unproven nature of the whole UAM market itself. Their specific strategies absolutely create unique weaknesses. Okay, like what for Joby? For Joby, the primary risk is really internal execution. Their success hinges on flawlessly managing that massive high volume manufacturing ramp up at the Ohio facility, right. handling incredibly complex supply chains, mm. perfecting the operational logistics all simultaneously. It's a lot to juggle. It's a monumental task. Think about it. If Joby hits a major manufacturing stag next year, how quickly do they burn through that remaining $991 million? One key supplier failure, one delay in getting the factory running smoothly, that could automatically trigger a need for more cash, maybe a dilutive capital raise from a position of weakness. It's a real high-wire act requiring near internal perfection. Okay, intense internal pressure for Joby. And Archer's Achilles heel, then. Is it the inverse? Exactly. It's external dependency. Because they rely so heavily on partners, their fate is partially outside their direct control. They need Stellantis to meet highly aggressive production targets on time with quality. They need United to provide seamless, reliable operational integration into complex existing airport systems. So Archer's risk is really trusting their partners to execute. Right. If a key partner stumbles, Archer stumbles too. Mm -hmm. Less direct control over critical path items. Hmm. But one factor that seems to be de-risking the entire industry, maybe leveling the playing field slightly, is government influence, right? both regulatory and as a customer. A huge factor, absolutely yeah. critical. Look, the FAA's landmark regulatory decision a while back, creating the specific powered lift aircraft category, uh -huh. and then finalizing the initial pilot rules through what's called an SFR, a special federal aviation regulation. Yeah. That fundamentally removed the existential regulatory risk for the whole industry. The big question is no longer if these aircraft can ever be certified. It's now mostly a question of when and working through the detailed process. Okay, so a clearer path exists now. And the government isn't just the rule maker, it's becoming the first big customer too. Exactly. Both Joby and Archer are key participants in the Department of Defense's AFWORTS Agility Prime program. This is huge. How much money are we talking? Joby has a contract potentially valued up to $131 million. Archer's is potentially up to $142 million. This provides critical non-dilutive funding, meaning cash, without selling more stock. And real-world testing. Crucially, yes. Real-world operational testing, flying missions for the military. It gives them flight hours, data, and a clear path to some near-term revenue even before commercial services start. And this experience, like Joby recently completing a major defense exercise where its autonomous tech logged over 7,000 miles, that builds a safety track record that the FAA takes very, very seriously during certification. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So pulling this all together, what does this mean for you, the listener, or maybe the potential investor? The decision seems to hinge entirely on your conviction in one of these two really powerful, yet almost opposite, strategies. That's the bottom line. Let's try a final synthesis. Betting on Jovi is essentially a bet on the strategic superiority of vertical integration long term. Believing they can pull it off. Right. It promises potentially higher long term profit margins, maybe eventual market dominance, through absolute technological and manufacturing mastery if they succeed. It is definitely the higher risk potentially higher reward approach, and importantly, the one with the shorter financial runway right now. Okay. And the alternative? Betting on Archer is a bet on the pragmatic, maybe de-risk strategy. It prioritizes speed to market, financial resilience, leveraging world-class partners to hopefully scale faster and cheaper initially. With that longer runway. Exactly. It boasts that significantly longer capital runway over four years, offering crucial flexibility against delays. But you have to accept the trade-off less direct control, and potentially lower long-term margins compared to a successful vertically integrated Joby down the road. So the choice really boils down to ultimate control and potential future margin dominance versus speed, partnerships, and a massive financial buffer. Tough call. But here is the final provocation, something for you to really mull over. The DOD's deep involvement that government support it signals a massive and durable market that might actually transcend the whole commercial passenger race we've been focused on. Hmm, interesting point. Think about it. 
The DOD's FY26 budget request includes something like $9.4 billion, specifically earmarked for autonomous and hybrid aircraft development and procurement. So even if the commercial path, the air taxi service, hits unexpected turbulence or delays, this huge governmental adoption signal suggests the underlying eVTOL technology itself is almost guaranteed to mature and find a very significant paying customer in defense. Uh -huh. What stands out to you about that massive government-funded floor potentially sitting under this whole industry? Something to think about. We'll catch you on the next deep dive.